Quiet, please. Quiet, please. QuietPlease.org presents Quiet Please, which is written by and features Paul Merrill. Quiet Please for tonight is called Fire and Shadow. My friends, by the time you hear this, I will be alive. My whole life so far, I've been dead. We all have. This world, this universe is dead. It's a mere shadow of reality, an empty gray husk. It wasn't until very recently that I came to this realization. Yesterday evening, to be precise. Just 12 hours ago. It's amazing how totally your perspective can change in just half a day. They call it a paradigm shift. When a new fact comes along that forces you to reevaluate everything else in light of it. For your whole life, you believe the sun orbits the Earth. Then the next moment, you're recalculating the orbits of the entire cosmos to fit your new realization that it's the Earth that orbits the sun. You spend your life believing the universe follows clear deterministic principles. Then quantum mechanics is developed and everything changes. In philosophy, these shifts can be even more dramatic. A Christian suddenly becomes an atheist, and a lifetime's worth of accumulated beliefs that depended on the central faith collapses like a deck of cards. All of our beliefs, all of our truths, are built around a few foundational beliefs we never question and are rarely even conscious of, and we build our entire epistemology outward around them. And then, something comes along, out of nowhere, blindsides us, and forces us to discard a foundational belief and rebuild our epistemology from something new that prompts us to radically different conclusions. So anyway, yesterday evening, February 22nd. That was the night of the big storm, you may remember. The electricity went out and it was chilly, so a few of us were huddled around the fireplace in the common room. What a storm! It must be the biggest storm ever! You're exaggerating, Sally. Remember the one about 15 years ago that flooded downtown? My school was evacuated, took them years to fix the gym after it flooded. Power was out for two days where we lived, all our food went bad. Well, uh, anyway... It feels so nice to be in here instead of out there. There's something elemental about it. Primal. The raw power of nature over technology. It strips us back to our roots. Always trying to make things profound, eh, Percival? But it's pretty cool, yeah. Cool? It's horrible. It could flood and we're trapped in here in the dark, cut off from everything. What if it'll change, Storm? It won't flood. And we'd evacuate if it did. Try to think of it as an adventure. We can huddle around the fire like cavemen. More like prisoners chained up in a cave. Prisoners in a cave with fire. That's a thought. This building is our cave. We're the prisoners chained to the wall, and the fire... What about the fire, Percy? It ought to be behind us, Jonah, but it's not. We can see it. Maybe that's significant. Plato's allegory of the cave? I think we may be living it. What's that? It's a thought experiment from thousands of years ago, Soren. Imagine a row of prisoners in a cave, tied up for life so they can't turn their heads. 
There's a fire behind them and a featureless cave wall in front of them. All they know of the world is the shadows on the wall. All they know of any activities in the cave behind them is whatever shadows are cast. They come to believe that they themselves are shadows because whatever movements they can make are reflected in the shadows. Were the prisoners living that scenario right now? Suffering like they are? Well, they don't think they're suffering. They think it's normal and right. But like Percy said earlier, they're facing the wall or facing the fire. Yes, our shadows are behind us. We should turn around. And so we turn to face the wall. Consider shadows. We process them like they're things, but there's nothing there. Just reduced light. The real meaning of a shadow only becomes clear when we can turn and see the light source and the interceding object. And yet, they feel so real. Look at them dance. It's sinister. Not everything surreal is sinister, Soren. It's beautiful. Look, I'm making a camel. I see each of our shadows. There's an elephant. And the shadows of the chair. Sometimes I wonder if there's anything between your ears, Sally. That wasn't nice, Soren. Sorry. Her incessant cheerfulness wears me down. The shadow of the lamp. The shadows well, of the three cups. doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> What's that? Jonah, what's wrong? There! That shadow! It's not me! The way they're dancing, it could be anything. Something small, magnified out of proportion. Does it matter? It might matter. Don't let Percy get to you, Jonah. Remind me, Percy, how did Plato's allegory end? The escaping prisoner turns around and sees the fire then leaves the cave to see the real world. He comes back and tries to free the other prisoners, but they were afraid of his wild stories and his lack of respect for the shadow world, so they refuse to follow. They call him crazy and dangerous. And as Percival spoke, I swear the shadow I was watching extended a finger, as if beckoning me towards it. Are you all right, Kona? You seem a little rattled. I'm fine. I was just getting too absorbed in the shadows. Turn back to the fire so you can warm your hands. You'll feel better. The storm will be over soon. Okay. Okay. So I was watching the fire again, and it seemed like the fire, too, could be a world of its own. Have you ever really stared into a fire? I mean, really stared? For minutes until the crackle and the dance of a flame envelops your mind? Such tremendous energy and activity? I can understand why some of the ancients believed fire to be alive. Fire is better than shadow anyway. Oh. Do you know how a steel is strengthened? Fire. Do you know how gold is tested and purified? Fire. The best and the strongest things in life go through fire. That's Percival's way of saying fire is pretty. Nobody would dispute the beauty of it. Except maybe Soren. Hmm. It's nice. I just wish I could shake this feeling that somebody's looking over my shoulder.
I went back to my room. I needed to be alone with my thoughts for a while, to let them percolate. As I laid out on my bed to think, I felt an overwhelming sensation that I was very near to working out a hidden truth which would forever transform me. But sometimes the most momentous truths can't be reached through all the concerted effort in the world, but only by opening the mind. So I tried to relax. What do you have? Scotch mist. Coming right up. busy tonight. You got a trivia night or something? You nuts? You're the only one here. Well, what about all those... Just shadows. I'll have another scotch mist. to be a shadow, Jonah. What's that? You can be real. The rest of them are happy being shadows, but there's something different about you. You're meant to be more. This is getting to be a pretty peculiar conversation. Maybe I'm dark already. I'm not what I appear to be, Jonah. You're not a bartender. I'm not a bartender. I'm not Percival either. This is just my shadow, dancing on the wall of your cave. What are you really, then? Turn around. So I turned around, and there behind me was a creature such as I had never imagined. It was shaped like a person, but made entirely out of fire. Fire somehow hanging there, static, never burning out. Fire with eyes and ears and a nose and a mouth. This is what I really am. It's what you really are too. If you break your chains, you'll see. This isn't possible. It's incongruous with the reality you've accepted. That's because the reality you've accepted is mere shadow you cling to because it's comfortable and predictable. Look deeper. And as I looked, the room seemed to catch fire, a heatless, uniform fire. I covered my eyes as it became painfully bright. When I uncovered them, the bar was gone. I was floating in an indescribable space. The fire there seemed like a sort of mist permeating everything, and I could sense many people around me, their fiery eyes upon me. You can see us now, Jonah. That means you're ready to join us. Where are we? The real world. The real world? This doesn't feel real. It feels like a dream. Your dreams are closer to reality than the flat shadows of your waking life. Of course this isn't strictly real. It's only a representation of the real within your dream. We're trying to give you a preview. This place is like heaven and hell rolled into one. Sometimes mystics catch a glimpse of reality, but turn back afraid and weave it into religious stories in the shadow world. Are you afraid, Jonah? No, I'm not afraid. I feel like I ought to be, but I'm not afraid. Then join us. 
You must transcend. How do I do that? Imagine yourself in two dimensions and think how you transcend to the third dimension. I can't see how. Remember Plato's allegory. Remember the shadows. Two-dimensional shadows with three-dimensional causes. The further you look from the fire, the further you look from the truth. The shadows are the furthest point You'll from the fire. You'll know the way. Think about it. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking it was just a dream. And it was a dream, of course, but why just? Is there not more truth in vivid dreams than in the dullness of our waking lives? In our dreams, the submerged truth rises to the top. To be true to ourselves, we must be true to our dreams. Every morning, I wake up feeling like a shadow of myself. Feeling like there's something vital slipping from my mind. Something I can't quite remember. But I can still remember how clear and vivid and shockingly meaningful it seemed a few minutes ago. Hold fast to dreams. For if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams. For when dreams go... Life is a barren field, frozen with snow. What was that? Langston Hughes. Start. <laughs> so very dark. We will not come here again. You must transcend to us. As I showered, I felt the world of shadows slipping off my skin down the drain. I imagined a creature in flatland on my shower's wall. It couldn't perceive me, but it could perceive my shadow falling over it. Even when the light source is beyond perception, the changes in light levels are perceptible. The existence of the higher world can be deduced from patterns of light and shadow. The positions of objects might even be extrapolated. Fire is the origin point, the creator of light and shadow, the source of everything. If we seek truth, the fire is where we must go. My course is clear. I've considered this from all angles. There is only one reasonable course of action. In a moment, I will walk out into the common room where the morning fire will be roaring. I will calmly leap into the fire and become truly alive for the first time. I don't expect I'll come back, so I'm leaving this message behind to let me know what happened to me. Please make sure it's passed on to my friends and family so they don't worry. Yours sincerely, Jonah Sheridan, room 127, Oakville Psychiatric Hospital. The title of tonight's Quiet Please story was Fire and Shadow. It was written by Paul Nerum, and the man who spoke to you was Paul Nerum. And John Allen Gaunt played Percival. Virginia Hargrove played Sally and Fireperson. Paul Moss played Soren. Lindsay Townsend was the nurse, and Gary Wallen was Charlie. Now, for a word about next time. The ghost of Willis Cooper. Time travelers of the future are old hat. But what would you do if you met a time traveler from the past? Join us next time for a little story I call The Future of History. 
And so until next week at the same time, I am proudly yours, Ernest Chappell.